Thank you, Terry. Thank you, uh, worshipers, worship team. So beautiful to hear you sing and to sing with you. And Muriel, thank you for your beautiful flute solo. And thank you uh, for putting Michael's name in the bulletin so that I could for sure get the right to win. That's how I did that. Thank you, all of you, for all the ministry that you did today. If you can't be here, we welcome you that are online. If you didn't be here, we welcome you that are online. Um, One of the reasons why we would want you to come is everybody who watches online, after they come here, they say, oh, it's good online. It's much better when we're in person. So do come and join us if you're thinking about it. We won't bite. We promise. We're nice people. There's coffee on back there. It's a friendly bunch, regular folks. Uh, We'd love to have you. And here's another reason why, because sometimes if you don't, I think I, uh, oh, you are. You guys scooted over on the pew, and I, I saw you spread out when the kids left. You guys scooted over. The, the other reason why you don't want to be online when something happens like this is we have a new Bethel person that was just born to the Moore family, and her name is Natalie Anna, and she's here in church today. So a soft uh, round of applause. If you don't wake her up, just and then we're so, look at her. Look at her. Got her little Sunday go to meet and close on there. Matt is bursting with pride. Pray for him. And, uh, he's a hardworking, good man. And Nikki, I, I want to talk out of school, but she came in the church office and, and she said something you don't often hear a lady say after she gave birth. She said, the next one, she said that. I was like, oh, the next one is what we don't say. Uh, fellas don't say that. I've learned this. They don't say that. More family, you are such a blessing to us. We're so glad that you're part of the Bethel family and that you've opened your heart to welcome a little child into the world. And we uh, are so happy for you. And we love you so much. We love each of you. And that's why sometimes we have to say hard things. Sometimes the Bible is like, going on a hike and you you come across a a patch of raspberries in the spring and they're just sweet and sometimes the bible is like when you're parched with thirst and somebody hands you an ice cold glass of pure water and sometimes the bible is like snow on the mountain that melts down into a valley and then beautiful long periods of time and sometimes the bible is like milk to grow our spiritual bones or to grow little babies up into adults. And sometimes the Bible is like meat for making men and women strong. And sometimes the Bible is like a patch of flowers, a garden of flowers that just brings beauty into our life. And sometimes the Bible is like, have you found this true? GPS unit telling you the way home when you're lost. And sometimes the Bible is like a mirror telling you you have something on your face. Something needs to change. Something's wrong. But other times, the Bible's like a tornado siren warning us that a very deadly danger is around. And today's text is a, it's not one of the happy texts of the Bible, though many happy texts exist. It has things embedded in it that are very encouraging But it is a tornado siren text of the Bible. And you think about this. If there is a deadly danger, if there is a mortal danger, if there is a danger to a person's body and soul, and you don't tell them about it, you really don't believe or you really don't love them. And so that's why Peter, when he comes to the end of his life, and he's giving, he knows he's giving his last word, putting it in print, if you will, sending it out to the beloved churches, he's probably going to say the thing that's the most important to him at the time. And his first letter in 1 Peter is it's, it's strengthening and helping people finish strong if they're going to face suffering because he sees that they're going to face suffering. He's going to die a martyr's death on a cross. His second letter, though, is to help people with another problem, and that is on this pilgrimage to God and to heaven And there are going to be people who try to misdirect us on the way. There are going to be people who give us wrong directions. 
And there always have been people that will give us wrong directions. And there always will be people who would give us wrong directions. And that's why Peter's written this. And it's so germane. It's so relevant to our time. Because denial of God's truth is in the groundwater of our culture everywhere. It's in the air that we breathe. Denial of God's truth is in the movies that we watch. Almost all of them. Denial of God's truth, creative denial of God's truth is in the television programs that we choose, the, the books that we read, uh, the voices among us, among the popular culture, the voices in, of the cultural elite, or, or the voices of, of some educators who don't know the Lord, of entertainers and athletes and models and actors and authors and influencers everywhere who are putting seeds of doubt or denial of the plain truth of the Bible into the air every single day. And I think you know this. If you have the Holy Spirit living in you, you have this little sense of that, like, that's not right. Peter had that, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And more and more, you and your children and your grandchildren and some of your great-grandchildren will hear the voices of the popular culture, and they will doubt the plain truth of the Bible. You can't live in this world without being exposed to it. It's like a deadly spiritual virus. It's in the air we breathe. But Peter is going to warn about religious deception. Almost like you wouldn't expect that when you go to church, somebody might tell you something that was wrong. You wouldn't expect somebody that uses the same language that's Bible language would misdirect you. You wouldn't expect a church that has a steeple, an organ, friendly people saying religious sounding things. You wouldn't expect to be misdirected in church. But Peter says the misdirection is not going to just be those who openly declare themselves the enemies of God who don't believe the Bible, but will be those who claim to believe the Bible sometimes. So it is very, very, very difficult. So he's going to deal with, with this, and you heard the text, or part of it that Terry read today. He's going to deal with it with, with gravity, with seriousness, with blood earnest seriousness. And I would I would call us today, as a church family, as we study the Bible together, you know, week by week, we go through chunks of the Bible, just what does God say next, what does God say next, what does God say next? And look what God says next. It's a, it's a, it's a very heavy, very heavy uh, chapter of the Bible. It's a tornado siren text of the Bible. And Peter is a person who understood that the best of us could be misdirected and even deny the Lord because he himself had experience and had to be corrected and had to be brought back to the right path. And if this can happen to Peter, Peter is saying before he dies, this could happen to you. So in times like these, on our pilgrimage, we need teachers, we need leaders, we need guides who will tell us the truth, will show us the right way, and their teaching will correspond with the Bible, and their life will correspond with their teaching. And so we, we go to a smoke detector passage of the Bible today. We go to a, we like to be in a garden passage of the Bible, and we like to be in a milk and honey passage of the Bible, but we're kind of in a horseradish patch here today. So I'm, and I, and I was thinking about, do I have the right to soften this any? Because I have an instinct to soften it. I kind of hate going here. And then I thought, about something interesting in our text. Our text is 2 Peter 2. And 2 Peter 2 is unique in the Bible. It's very unique because there's another place in an epistle that parallels it with an uncanny parallel. And that is in the little book of Jude, right at the end of the New Testament before Revelation, the book of Jude. And if you compare them, they're, they're, they're obviously same source material. Shocking. You can kind of interpret one with the other a bit. And in that passage, Jude, in verse 3, there's only one chapter, Jude says the same thing, the instinct I have. Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. You see it? He said, what I wanted was I just wanted to preach the gospel. I just want to tell Jesus loves you. I just want to tell you the way to heaven. But it's necessary. It's needed. Listen, you're a young married couple. 
And that means sometimes you will have to earnestly contend for the faith. You're a young person, and you are going to face all of this stuff out ahead of you. And the world in America is probably not going to get better. It, we could have a great sweeping revival, but that may not happen. And you're going to have to face a hostile world. And if your faith survives, it'll be because you had to learn to earnestly contend for the faith. If you're a real man, we can't tell by how much you can bench press or how often you can drive a nail straight or, or how effectively you can, you can kill deer that you baited, you know. Sorry about that. I, I didn't mean that. You, you know, that's, that's, it, that's not a sign of manhood. I know what you're saying. You're only saying that because you couldn't hit the broadside of the barn. True, true, it's true. But the real test of a person's man is that they don't just see, I need to provide for my family. A good man doesn't just say, I need to provide for my family. A good man doesn't just say, I need to protect my girl here. Physically, morally, a, a, a real man, a, a godly man says, there are spiritual dangers about. And I will protect my family from those spiritual dangers. I will see and label those and warn my family in a way, in a creative way. He was doing that. Jude wanted to do that. I, I want to do that. I've always loved what Paul said when he parted with his beloved Ephesian elders. I, I love this scene. It's in Acts 20. It's in one of the most beautiful scenes in the Bible when Paul is on his way to die and he goes to Miletus and he, and he has a meeting with the elders from Ephesus that he'd spent a lot of time with. And he, he obviously loved them and they loved him. A very affectional, touching scene there. Acts 20, 20, in this long uh, passage, he says, you know, I did not shrink from, the, he's, two times he said, I didn't shrink back. I wasn't afraid. I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you from house to house. He goes, I preach it in church. I came to your house and I said it. And I didn't take anything that was profitable and shrink back from saying it. It's one of the ways you can tell if your church is sound and orthodox. It doesn't just say things that are true from time to time. It doesn't leave any true things unsaid, even if they're hard. Later in the same text in 2020, for I did not shrink uh, from, I'm sorry, yeah, 20, uh, 27. I didn't shrink from declaring you the whole counsel of God, 2027, 20, Acts 2027. 20, Not all the texts are hellfire and damnation text. Um, but the whole counsel of God, everything he said, I'll teach, everything that's profitable. He didn't just teach the happy text of the Bible. He didn't just teach the warning, the hellfire and damnation, which are there. He didn't just do that. He said, I didn't shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. I was thorough and careful that I made sure and taught you everything. Because you need everything. And you have everything you need. That's what he's going to say. He said that in the first chapter. You have everything you need for life and godliness. Therefore, we want to teach everything. We want to be, we want to be thorough. And, oh. So it's interesting. He said, then in Acts 1, he said, so I am innocent from the blood of all men. And what's implied is that preachers who shrink from teaching everything God gave us will have blood on their hands. You see, that's serious. That's why this is a tornado warning text of the Bible. Teachers and preachers who don't teach everything may have blood on their hands. They may be culpable, guilty of mishandling the souls of people. We don't have our own version of the Bible. We have the Bible. We teach the Bible. It's sufficient. It's complete. It's clear. And we teach it. So that's one of the reasons why in a church like this, we often are just going through a book, next chunk, next chunk, next chunk, because it's one of the ways we feel very confident. Okay, this is what God said in Holy Writ, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's inspired, it's inerrant, it's verbally inspired, every word. It's plenarily inspired, the whole thing is inspired. It's infallible in its original autographs, and there were a series of miraculous providences that bring us a very reliable Bible. And if that's true, then we just teach it. And it's powerful what it does. And so it's, it gives you great confidence. And when everything else in the world is all shook up, you think, well, I have my Bible, and I am not going to deviate from what the Bible clearly says. Well, well understood. And so on a dangerous journey, which we're on, dangerous and wonderful journey, you want a good guide. You want to choose your, you want a good map, and you want good guides. You want faithful guides. Now, there's more than one way to err, you know, Frequently, as a pastor, you'll and permit me uh, a little humor. You'll visit with people, and they will say, "Oh, good to see you, pastor." And then they'll tell you about their favorite, like, televangelist or television preacher or, or radio preacher, 
and, and, and that's fine. I, I do the same thing. I have mine. I, I, Lois can tell you all the time. I'm listening to somebody, watching somebody. I know you do too. That's wonderful. But it is humorous. Every once in a while, you know, they'll, somebody will say, and then I will say to them, well, Charles Stanley's good, but he didn't visit you in the hospital today. That was me. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, but that's on a weaker day. <laughs> My point, though, is sometimes somebody will say, they'll name their favorite, you know, media preacher, and it will be a happy text guy. All he ever does is pick the happy texts of the Bible. And he says this is his calling, but he also calls himself a minister of the gospel. But he neglects ministering the whole counsel of God. So you, you know, one way to err is to only pick the happy text. Now, have you ever met the, the sour pickle pastor who, and he's not usually making a lot of money online, but, but, he, but in every community, you got, they're just like, all they do is they go from one, one hellfire and damnation nor strategy text to another because it's like that's the only voice they have now I, I would just say this and as pastoral help if you have a guy picking only the happy text run run leave leave go don't run yeah if you have a guy picking only the hellfire and damnation text run <laughs> leave you 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 we this is why we want, and many, many, many pastors are faithful. Many, many, many pastors are faithful. Most pastors are faithful. That I know. In Bible preaching churches, you understand. The ones I know are committed to the authority of the Scripture. You know, you'll see online, you'll see pastors doing bad things. You'll see this happen. This does happen. We're sinful. All of us. But, the, but by far and away, the pastors that I know, and I hang out with pastors, I've, met, I've got kids that are pastors, dads are pastors, my brothers that are pastors, and Lots of friends hang out with pastors all the time. Most of them are just sincerely trying to follow God and teach the Bible. So I'm not attacking other pastors. I'm just saying, if a, past, if a pastor is all heaven and no hell, run. <laughs> if he's all hell and no heaven, run. If he's all judgment and no mercy, run. If he's all mercy and no judgment, <laughs> run. If he's all warning and no encouraging or all encouraging and no warning, run. <laughs> pastors that never preach the alarm text of the Bible are not faithful. And have I made my point? I, I think I've kind of overkilled my point. Okay, you're like, okay, can we get to the, yes, we can. All right, so in, in the, let's look at the text now. As we, we've kind of set that up so that I want you to see it again as we've heard it read. And I want to show you four things from it that are very, very clear. One, the problem of false teachers in the church. And two, the influence of false teachers in the church. And three, the end of false teachers in the church. And four, what about the good people that are around when false teachers are around? What about them? What's, what's the hope of them when there's so many false teachers? So we're going to talk about the problem of false teachers in the church and, and the influence of false teachers in the church and the doom of false teachers in the church. And what about faithful folks that are living in our time, okay? First of all, the problem of false teachers in the church is, here's the idea. We always have and we always will need to be on the lookout for false teaching. Let's look at the text now. Chapter 2, verse 1. But he just talked about the Bible and the more sure word of prophecy and that were moved by the Holy Spirit, carried along by the Holy Spirit, and wrote what they wrote down, and that became our Bible, Old Testament. At the, at the and then he says, but false prophets also arose among the people, meaning Israel, his people. Just as there will be false teachers among you. So it's like, watch out, even in, in the church. There'll be false teachers among you who will secretly, they won't be overt about it, they'll be sneaky, <laughs> secretly bring in destructive heresies or destructive divisions or destructive false teachings, even denying the master who bought them as if they were really saved, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves destruction, swift, swift destruction. When false prophets arose among the people, there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. You see, it's a serious text. So, a couple of things. They'll rise up, and they will rise up among us. So, they'll use the same terms that we use. Like, like an extreme example, there are people who preach on Resurrection Sunday, and they don't really believe that Jesus literally and physically rose from the dead. There are people who will, will talk about the resurrection and really mean on the side kind of a resurrection ethic. Or a thing, it's kind of a, like, it's, they, they don't really mean the same things. Or they'll say the Bible is God's word. And what they mean is, the Bible contains things that came from God, but it's not a perfect book, and we can basically it. 
So this is not uncommon. Um, some people, and, and then this passage too, this chapter 2, verse 1 that says, you know, there were, old, there were false prophets in the Old Testament along with the true prophets, and there will be false teachers among you, and this will, will always be the case. That, that helps us answer the question that most unbelievers have when they are slow to believe. Many people that you work with will say, well, I know people that go to church and they're hypocrites. Sometimes what they mean is, I know people that go to church and they're not perfect. Not everybody that's not perfect is a hypocrite. You're going to see that in a minute. Uh, with uh, a little later in the text today. But this is an answer to that. Yes, the, the Bible doesn't say that everybody who calls himself a Christian is Christian or that all Christians are perfect. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that we're going to be a mixed lot right up to the end. So that person is maybe insightful or or maybe not. At the very end, we'll need to be warned and aware of false prophets and false teachers. Words of Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, which is talking about the future, Matthew 24, 11, many false prophets will arise and lead men astray. That's in the end. Also in Matthew 24, in the Olivet Discourse, in the last discourse of Matthew, verse 24, false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders and as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. This is a serious, like, so, so here's what I'm saying. Is that, and that is, you, you got to pick your guide real carefully. It, does this accurately teach the Bible? And does this guide's life look like what he says or she says? This is super important. And Peter's saying that's important. Now, so, the problem of false teachers in the church is a, is a problem that we'll always have. Second, the influence of false teachers. Notice in verse 2, it says, and many will follow their sensuality. Many will follow. Because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. So there's going to be an influence within the church, and there's going to be a, a, a negative influence outside of the church. People within the church that will follow, and the Bible says many will follow. There's not the only place in the Bible that says that. Broadway leads to destruction. Many will be deceived. You think, I'm in a minority. Well, if you're, I'm, you, you may say, well, I'm, most people agree with me. Well, if most people agree with you, you're wrong. Go study the Bible. Get on the minority side. Fewer believe. Um, in the end, that's the way it's going to be. And then the other influences, notice it says that those within are going to be influenced in a negative way. A toxic influence in the church. Many will follow. There's a toxic influence outside the church. Notice it says the way of truth will be blasphemed. You see this all the time. When leaders, or Christian leaders, or pastors, or, or Christians do something that's completely unethical, they do something that's completely immoral, and, it, and it, then it's like that's, they're eager to per report the news. They have a right to do it, and they're eager to do it. Many are eager to do that. Ah, oh, there are people that are just eager to display every time someone falls. And then what happens? It's an occasion for the enemy to blaspheme the way. It's interesting that what it says, I think it's beautiful in, in, in a sense. Um, Many will follow their sensuality because of them. The way of truth will be blasphemed. So this way of truth, this teaching of truth, the direction that you go in your, this is, a, this is a thing to be guarded. This is a thing to be followed. This is a thing not to be blasphemed, not to confuse people, but there's a way of truth. There is a way of truth. There is a way to have a godly home. There is a way to have a fulfilling marriage. There is a way to finish faithful. There is a way to walk with God. There is a way to be a godly man and a good man, a happy man. There's a way to be a fulfilled mom or wife or grandma. There's a way for a young person to make his way. It's the way of truth. But when people err, they, they give an occasion for the way of truth to be blasphemed, and that's a bad, bad thing. So this is the influence of false teachers. They're present, and they're very influential. And you'll notice a few things. They, they're influenced by sensuality. So there's, sometimes there's a twisting of sexual ethics. Like that reads like the newspaper. the Bible, they go to the texts of Scripture that talk about human sexuality, and they twist them. They're going to put legal teeth in this soon. They go to the passage of Scripture about sexuality, and they say, they say something, then they say, in order to make a way for people to practice immoral behavior. And we're all susceptible to this, not just those bad people out there. Often sexual immorality in the choir loft, in churches, in 
among Christian leaders. Has been, will be. But God help us. So one of the ways you can tell a person is a false teacher is if they're saying all the right things, but you watch their life, and there's this sinful sensuality in their life. Doesn't mean they don't slug, have a slugfest with it. But they're characterized by it. They yield to it. He says, that's in verse 2, the sensuality. Many will follow their sensuality. And then there's a stubbornness, too, and unwillingness to submit. You'll see that later in the text because they're, they're characterized more. We'll get to that next week. There's a whole, there's a whole, we kind of double back and go over it again next week. And the next, the rest of the text talks about this. You, they're characterized by sensuality and or stubbornness. An unwillingness to submit. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. When anybody says, I don't want anybody telling me what to do, like, nobody likes to be bossed around by an unsympathetic authority, present company included. Nobody likes that. We all get that. But a real Christian has an idea that they're under God and that they're under God's agents. And a real Christian is guided by the Holy Spirit to be eager to find who has God put in my life to help me? A teenage girl might say, my dad isn't perfect, but he's my dad. And I'm going to trust him and listen to him. If he has a warning for me, even if he seems like he's old and crotchety, he doesn't get it, I'm going to try to submit to that and trust him. And God will, God will often work through your dad. I know not all girls have godly dads, and that might be hard, but, but it's really, really common for us to say our parents are old-fashioned, and they're like, you know, no, people that are filled with like a girl, a teenage girl, that's filled with the Holy Spirit. And she's coming to graduate from high school. And she's got all kinds of decisions to make. Now is the most important time for her to stay close to mom and dad and the wise older people in her life and listen to them and be under authority. Who are the authorities in my life? I, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about godly authorities or even, even sometimes unsympathetic or imperfect authorities that God may still work through them. But a person that, so these false teachers do not want anybody over them. And then there's the greed, verse 3. Um, and, and in their greed, they will exploit with false words. Um, we're going to get to verse 3, but, but there are those who often false teachers can tell because they've got a, a money scheme running. I've recently got a, somebody kind of, what, what is it, invited me to follow them. And I did because it was a, a high-profile Interesting. That person, a high profile religious person, would want. I don't know, everybody knows that person. And then immediately I got these solicitations to give money to a thing. <laughs> I'm like, and I was like, you don't. And they were looking at your profile. We're like, I'm like, you don't, you don't know me. You don't know me. That's a, it's a little religious scam thing. I'm like, wow, that's. What if a lost person got that? That'd be discouraging. I heard you maybe heard about the guy that was trucking holy water from a place in Mexico. A, place where there's supposed to be a sighting of the Virgin Mary or something in Mexico, and so he, he got the holy water. I'm telling a joke right now, just so you know. Yeah. So he got the holy water in a tank or truck, and he was coming up to the board. They said, what do you got in there? And he goes, holy water from, you know, and they said, let's see. And they tasted it, and he said, that's tequila. And he goes, it's a miracle. <laughs> Can't say I was going to tell a funny joke. I just said I was going to try to tell a joke. So I've done that. But it isn't funny. It really isn't funny. False teaching isn't funny. And, and, and especially when people are teaching things that are true and living immoral lives or encouraging people to live immoral lives or teaching things that are true and they're greedy or teaching things that are false and they're greedy or they're stubborn and they're encouraging stubbornness. Or the other one is sensuality, stubbornness, greed, and deceit. They're sneaky. They're not straightforward. I love it, you know, that when Paul says, I commend... My, uh, everywhere to, the, uh, my, to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm speaking plainly, he says. I don't need to be deceitful. I, I don't need to con you. I don't need to work an angle on you. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to leave it right there. And the Holy Spirit's going to pick it up. That, that's the way it ought to be. Right here. This is what the Bible says. This is what the Spirit says. We don't have to sneak up on you. We don't have to be sneaky. This is, uh, but the false teachers are sensuality, stubbornness, greed, deceit. Now the third thing. First, the problem of false teachers in the church, we have them and we always will have them. The influence of false teachers in church, false teaching is widespread and very damaging. Third, 
the end of false teachers in verses 3 through 9, you're going to see that one day they will face God's judgment. And he gives three really scary examples of how God has judged in the past. And if he will judge in the past, he will judge in the future. And as this, the common man today wants the hippie Jesus, but they don't want the Jesus coming in judgment. They want the flower child Jesus, but they don't want the Jesus riding a white to take over and to judge his enemies with a sword coming out of his mouth. That's not the Jesus they want, but then it's the Jesus of the Bible. And they want Jesus that will help them succeed in life to do whatever they want to do, even if it's not right. They don't want the Jesus to tell them, this is what you need to change in your life, repent. This is the first words out of Jesus' mouth, repent. First word out of John the Baptist's mouth, repent. Listen, I, I love you. I'm telling you something that you need to hear. I say this in humility and love. Please, me. probably for you, the best word you can hear today is change, repent. You know, look at your life, say where it doesn't line up with God, just be broken and say, okay, God, I'm so sorry. I've been willful. I've done my own thing. I've gone my own way. I've done it my way. Now, I believe your word is true. And I'm going to repent. I'm gonna, I just want to change my mind, change my life, change my direction. Help me, God. He will help you. Right now, today, sitting in these pews, your life could be flipped in an amazing direction toward good and for eternal good and your family and your life and your children and your influence and your grandchildren someday if you just repent. How sweet is that? But you can't get that if somebody says, you're good, Jesus will help you. That's not, that's not the whole story. You're good, Jesus will help you. Change. <laughs> Jesus will help you. Repent. Turn from your sin. Turn to him. Follow his ways. Make him the Lord of your life. We often say salvation is free. Yes, it is. Of course it is. Jesus paid for our salvation. But you should understand this. If you get saved by grace through faith alone, it's free. Jesus paid for it. You didn't pay for it. He is going to expect to take over your life now, make the decisions, tell you what to do. And that's a blessed submission right there. I know you're thinking, mm, I'm like, well, okay, you don't serve God today. So now this is why we have this, this warning, this, this, this tornado siren, this please, this a pleading of a godly father, you know, Peter getting ready to die. He's going to give an, he's going to, you know, we talk about the, the enemies of the believer are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And he's going to give an example from the world and the flesh and the devil, not in that order. The first is the devil, the, the first example is fallen angels, demon, devils, if you will. The second example is uh, the world. It's the, the ancient world was flooded, verse 5. The third example is Sodom and Gomorrah, which are famous for fleshly indulgence of different kinds, in verses 6 through 8. Let's go through it again, verse 4. The angels who sinned, he's going to say, if we judge the angels who sinned, if God would judge angels and not spare angels, you know, verse 4. God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell. You know the theology of hell, right? There's, there's, the, there's the holding tank that we sometimes call hell and the eternal ultimate hell. This is a, a word that Peter's going to borrow from the Greek culture, Tartarus. It's like, like they're chained in the holding tank hell until they go to the lake of fire hell, the ultimate eternal hell. You can study that in, in the... Uh, uh, the uh, apocalyptic literature of the Bible, but is what he's talking about. Committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. Don't get confused by that aside I gave you. What's verse 4 talking about? Angels that sinned. What happened to them? They got judged. What are the details of that? Let's set that aside right now. Which angels were they? Let's set that aside for a moment. Just say, God will judge angels who sin. And a couple of examples in the Bible, the, the fall of angels, or if those were angels in Genesis 6, I imagine they were who sinned in Genesis 6, read that. That's some interesting reading right there. Jude is, seems to be referring to that in the parallel passage. So God says, I, if the angels sin, they'll be judged. Demons are fallen angels, you know. And so he says, if I would judge the angels, if they're going to be kept in gloomy darkness until judgment, then verse 5, if he didn't spare the ancient world, he's going to talk about the world that was destroyed in the flood, but preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, there were eight on the ark, right? When he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, God is going to judge, God in the past judged a world of ungodly people. He says, if I did it once, I'll do it again. Not the same way. It's kind of, that's why it's a tornado siren past the scriptures. It's not pretty. And then it, it kind of gets even harder. And if by turning the cities of Sodom, 
more into ashes. He condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. Now, if I'm listening to this, I'm going, Jesus, am I righteous or ungodly? Did you catch it? Righteous, ungodly. Don't be <laughs> discouraged. The guys called righteous here were absolutely not perfect. I'm telling you, they were not. But they were declared righteous. Thanks be unto God. And the ungodly, though, who didn't flee to believe in Jesus and what God, Jesus would do on the cross, they're facing what? God's judgment. So you, I, will of God or be under the mercy of God. We'll either be righteous in Christ or ungodly and face God's judgment. That's what he says three ways here. But he also says there's a little ray of sunshine that comes out of this, and he says, verse 7, he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormented, tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. This is who? Lot, who wasn't. You know what's real interesting? Thing? If you're a Bible student, you should study this. I, I would be interesting to know the conclusion you come to. People in the Old Testament sinned, and their sins are often recorded, and they're not pretty. Lot's sin. It's like, oh, mm. Noah's sin. Lots of not repeated in the New Testament. Samson's sin, I don't think it's repeated in the New Testament. Check me out on that. Lots of not repeated. What he's called a righteous man, he vexed his God. You, you wouldn't be able to tell by looking. Sometimes you'll meet somebody, they'll, they'll, they'll be a Christian, but they'll, they say they're a Christian, and then they, they do things that aren't, aren't consistent, and you're going, maybe they're not a Christian. And God looks on their soul, no, they're, they're, they're vexed in their soul. Oh, I couldn't tell that they were. So Lot here was... So, so let's clarify this so that we don't miss the main point is so obvious in a passage is the first chunk of this passage that we're teaching is really obvious. Look out, false teachers are still coming and are among you and many will be influenced by them. This is serious, look out. And then this second part of the passage, and God will judge them. Here's an example, here's an example, here's an example. And what else is he saying? There's, just, there's something for us, assuming that we are godly, God's people under the blood followers of Jesus. There's something for us. And that's those who don't follow them, false teachers, that is. In the midst of false teaching and the judgment of God, he will preserve those who are his. Say amen. I mean, if you say amen in church, this would be a good time to say amen. God will preserve those who are his. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Preserve me. Lord, I, I feel I'm a righteous man, but there's that indwelling sin. There's a remaining sin in me. Anybody have that in them? Were you going to lie in church? Yeah. You know, here, here's Lot vexing his righteous soul because of the behavior of the wicked, but he kind of got, like, he, he wasn't perfect himself. But he's grieved. Are you that way? I, I think I am. I feel I sin. I'm grieved over my sin. I'm still grieved over the sin of my culture. So he says, you're a hypocrite. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm grieved over my sin, my family's sin, your sin, all God's children's sin. And it grieves me. This is one of the ways you can tell if a person is genuinely saved. They grieve over sin. Do you grieve over what's happening in the culture? Do you grieve over the sin that's being like, that's being championed, that's going to be creatively championed in the culture, creatively pitched? You see it all the time. Everywhere in the culture, the selling, it's in the air, it's in the groundwater. Does it grieve you? That should grieve you. It shouldn't be holier than now. Holy. You should be grieved. You say, that same sin that's in me, if God didn't spare me, I would go to hell. But because I'm in Christ, I, I'm spared that. Are you grieved? Those who are his are not perfect, but they're righteous. And they're grieved by the rebellion. They grieve this in young people. Young people, listen. Um, I say, because I love you a lot. And I want to be faithful to you. I don't know how long I get to you go to college or something. That is, develop a hatred for sin. If a man and a woman come to your life and they're unrighteous, that you, you don't, your heart can't bond with them. Your life, you'll, you'll suffer. Follow the ways of God. Friday night, party. you want to have friends, you want to have fun, you, you wonder what's going on there. It's probably not good. You go to Bible study, prayer with a couple little old ladies. Good for you. Develop a hatred for sin and love for what's right. You will be in the minority. 
but my, you will be so happy when eternity burst on your soul and you realize everything my mom and dad taught me was true. The Bible is true and Jesus is God and he's going to reward me forever even though he saved me out of sin myself. Young people, listen. Don't let anybody ever turn you away from following God. And if you turn away, turn back, start over. Ask mom and dad. They had to do that. All of you, are you grieved? He preserved Noah. Called him a herald of righteousness, a preacher of righteousness, herald. He rescued Lot. Praises be unto God. Called him righteous. Read it again. Rescued righteous. We wouldn't know this only reading the Old Testament. You're like, what happened? I don't know. That did not look good at all. It was bad. And by the way, if you have a dark, grievous sin in your memory that you would never want to tell anybody, take it to Jesus Christ. You will not surprise him. Someday he may call you a righteous man, a righteous woman. Isn't that good? It's a sweet spot of the text. That's what he said. Greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, that righteous man, three times he's called righteous, lived among them day after day and was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and that he heard. And the Lord knows, this is so sweet, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly. Say it in your heart. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly. It's not all fire alarm text here. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. And then a little reminder, and keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those the difference bold and willful. They do not tremble. They blast the glorious ones. There are people who are saying, I believe the Bible, and it's okay to do this and this and this, and that was, they were, weren't right about that, and this is okay, and they've changed the definition of marriage as an example. They say it's okay to take the life of the unborn. They don't have the heart of God, yet they want to say their Bible. The churches in our town that are committed to making people welcome who are committed to violating the law of God. These are not churches. They're not. God's the one who gets to say what churches are. He can take their candlestick back. May that never be true among us. That we would say, God, we're the ones who we believe God how to rescue the godly and keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those who indulge in the lust of defilement and despise authority, bold and willful, do not tremble, and blasting the glorious ones. Usually what happens is people, they give into a fleshly indulgence, greed, or immorality, and then they can't get out of it because it's just so, the Bible says there's bondage in it, and then they have to change their Bible and say it's okay because they're in, they're, they're trying, to, we've all done this. I'm sure the Bible didn't mean that because that would mean I was, I'm in trouble. And so now we change in our theology instead of changing our life. But the good news, please hear it. Hear my love. The good news is God will help you change your life. God will help you fight against that downward tug of whatever it is, you know, that, that, that the immoral tug toward porn men, women, that, that immoral tug toward a same-sex attraction or gender confusion or something that's just like you're, you're, you're troubled. God loves you, knows you're troubled. God cares, and he's more compassionate than anyone you know. He will help you persevere to the end. He will help you live a faithful life. He will take you to himself. Well, never again you'll have to fight against sin in your life. That's what he's promising. This is the only good news there is in this culture. Not that like some of you, gonna, they're going to give you a sex change operation, and then you're going to be happy. You go from one partner to the other, and now your life is just unraveling because you don't have any security or any sensitivity or any, any, any in your life, any stability in your life. God says, no, you don't have to live like that. Don't be willful. Be humble. Young people, can I, one of you, if I say, I, I, I've said this week and think about, if I, if I got to take you hiking in the mountains of Kentucky, and we would go to, we would go down to, uh, Hoedown Island, and we would line dance and have fun and laugh, and then we would go over to Miguel's and have pizza, and we'd drink L8, that's a non-alcoholic beverage, just in case you're wondering, and then we would maybe go up on the mountain, and we would look at the natural bridge, but we would also go hell, because, listen, I know you're not from the mountains down here, but there are places that are paths, they look like they're the paths you walk on, but they're not, they're paths that right up to a precipice, that if you walk that path, you'll fall to your death, kids do it all the time, listen to me, Mission kids, we're in the mountains of Kentucky right now, okay? So don't fall off the cliff. 
I'm warning you. Now, you wouldn't get back in the bus and go, he's the meanest guy. I'm never going on a trip with him again. Hopefully, it's really nice of him to warn me about that. Thank you. Thank you for the warning. I love Michigan. I love it, even though spring will not fully arrive until May 15th. (laughs) It won't. I'm serious. May 15th, every year. I still love Michigan a lot. I love Michigan. This is the other morning. I love this part of my day. I get up in the morning out on Bittersweet Farm, and I open a door, and I, I'm getting ready to go out, come to church. And I stop on my side porch, and I take a deep breath. The sun's coming up over there, and I look out over a little acre that the Lord has given us. And I think, man, he's me. Uh, the other morning, I got up like that, and I take a deep breath, and it had it was a beautiful night. What I didn't realize is the steps were extremely slippery. I didn't know. I didn't know. And there's no handrail out there. It's just steps that are extremely slippery. I took a step and I almost went down hard. And I thought if I had fallen, I would have, bro- I would have broken the steps. I would have broken the world. I would have broken me. It would be bad. I'm a big man. And, and I have little spin bones under all this brisket. Oh, um, I thought, I got in the car, and I couldn't wait to warn my wife. I couldn't wait. Literally thought, Lois is going to go to work here in a minute. And she's so cute. She gets her little stuff together. She has her little stuff she's taking to work, and she gets herself ready, and she's off to work in her little car. And I imagine her going on those steps and thinking, oh, I would hate it if she hurt herself. And I called her. I said, honey, Please be careful on the steps. They are so slippery. They are really slippery. And then she said something really sweet back. So thank you so much for warning me. And then I backed my car out of the road like I do and turned to the west and went under that canopy of trees. And I looked over to the house where she's in the upstairs bedroom and I felt an unusual warmth toward her because I love her, and I didn't want her to get hurt. And because the way she said that back was just so sweet. Church, I try to warn you today. If you're here today, and maybe you're not a follower of Jesus yet, I was just trying to love you today. I to warn you, some people know what I said is true. If you're a Christian, and you've been trying to live for the Lord, and you're discouraged, and maybe your kids aren't where they ought to be, can I just encourage you? You are going the right way. Be a good example. Keep loving them. Keep praying for them. Speak when you are led of the Lord to speak. Shut up when you're led of the Lord to shut up. An example, pray. Keep following his way. They're going to need guides to make it to the holy city. And you can be one of those guides. We want you to go on the way with a